Hello, everybody. My name is Ray Dogum. I am the co-chair for the Healthcare Special Interest Group for Hyperledger Foundation. Uh, today is November 23rd. We'll be doing our general meeting and we'll be discussing some of the updates in the industry we've seen in the last couple of weeks. But before we get started there, this is being recorded and shared on YouTube. So if anyone wants to share anything, just be aware of that. Um, you can find the, uh, actually, let me share my screen here as well. So you can see the agenda. Okay. Hope you guys can see my screen here. So like I said, this is being recorded. You can find the Hyperledger antitrust policy here, and this is a public page. Uh, just to get started, are there any announcements that anyone would like to share here from the community about the special interest group, healthcare, blockchain, any personal news? Okay. Uh, just as a reminder, um, there are tons of different communities in the blockchain and healthcare space. There are other groups you can join here as well. And um, I'm not going to get through, talk about all of them here right now, but just wanted you to be aware of that. And in terms of upcoming events, there's two that I've highlighted here, but I'm sure there's plenty more. First one is the Blockchain Expo Global. And this is happening. Um, this will be on December 1st to the 2nd. And it's in London. Pretty big names supported here. Uh, and should be interesting for anyone in the blockchain space. I know Hyperledger is involved as well. Um, so if you're in London or interested in this event, check it out. There's also an event on patient experience, experience, which I thought was pretty interesting, happening in December as well, December 5th and 6th in California. It's about um, you know how to innovate for patient experience. Some pretty big names uh, from health systems here as well. So could be an interesting event for some of you all. And Ray, this is Wendy. Um, in a bot, in I don't know how to say. I I, I typed the acronym incorrectly in the chat, but oh. it's I N A T B A. They're hosting Digital Blockchain Week this week. Uh, it's mostly a European organization, <clears throat> and I am speaking on a panel on um, actually Thanksgiving Day at two o'clock in the morning um, for. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, uh, tr true, uh, true dedication. Um, okay. I'm speaking on a panel about privacy versus compliance conundrum with blockchains, which I am happy to share that. Uh, I'm happy to emphasize a voice of reason. So, um, but that's an, it's, it's, an, it's, it's free. It's a great organization about advancing blockchain. So uh, for the sessions that would be more tolerable for a U.S. audience, I definitely encourage you to participate. Wendy, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that. And we can put the, I'll make sure to put the link in the, um, either the YouTube or here in the agenda page as well. Great. Yeah. So the, the, can... the theme of the conference is the future of blockchain. And they are approaching it from many different industries. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Um, any other news or anything anyone wants to share? Okay. So as you can see from my background today, there's a lot of chaos in the blockchain world, especially with FTX and all of that. We'll, we'll be talking about that, but that article, one of the articles about FTX here in the agenda today. Uh, but before we get to that, I just wanted to you know talk about some other things going on first. Uh, number one is Hyperledger has approved a new project called Hyperledger Cactus. And the technical steering committee approved that um, recently, I think. Let me see here. Or oh, sorry, it's been renamed to Cacti. That's the announcement. Because they're adding Besu to, or they're adding another one to. It's Cactus Plus. Is it Besu? Yeah, I think they combined this. So the community has merged two systems, architectures as well as code bases to create a new project, Hyperledger Cacti. Um, 
And it's a multifaceted interoperability platform that draws on the cutting edge technical features of, of uh, Cactus and Weaver, a Hyperledger lab. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. I think I put the incorrect link here. So I'm going to make a quick adjustment to that so people don't get confused. Yeah, there was a workshop on, shop on it about a week ago on how to use it with it. I think it was a code along with it. Yes. So that's right. probably in the recordings. Most likely, yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Appreciate that. Uh, so that's one. I wanted to also, anyone have any specific information on that merger or any, are there, is anyone here working on that? They want to share anything about it? I'm just curious, what is it? So apparently it's an interoperability um, layer or platform. So it's a pluggable mm -hmm. framework to link networks built on heter heterogeneous uh, distributed ledger and blockchain tech and to run transactions spanning multiple networks. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot more information in this article as well. Pretty detailed. And I know that there's a you know a group that's specifically focused on this. They probably have more that they can share. And if you need help getting in touch with them, let me know. I can try to make a connection. Moving on to the next article here that I found I thought was interesting related to healthcare, specifically how we as patients get in touch with providers and doctors. And there's this trend where messaging or sending an email to a provider is starting to cost money for patients. Um, and I think Cleveland Clinic here is one of the first health systems uh, to start charging some messages that patients send Jeez. to their provider. Uh, so, you know, here it's saying it's either a cash grab or a logical business decision to compensate physicians for their time. Yeah. And I feel like this is a kind of a complex issue. Um, and it's interesting to see, you know, that even with all this technology and AI and, and the ability to, you know, make these systems more efficient, I would think with technology, um, you know, we're still nickel and diming patients, maybe I would say for, for messages, even as much as $50 per message, which isn't really nickel and diming. That's a pretty hefty cost for a message. Um, and I would just think about how can blockchain or, or crypto or distributed ledger technology, you know, make a difference with this. Um, but you, yeah. you know, what's ridiculous is that the the communication from patients through a patient portal is so much more cost effective than when patients call. Um, patients have to communicate with their physicians. Um, that's part of the patient relationship and it's considered part of the cost of doing business. So it it this this makes me think that it's as ridiculous, you know, as when banks charge, you know, $3 for using the ATM, but they don't charge when you go in and use the time of a person. And it's, I, I just hope that this doesn't become excessive because when we think of patients who um, have a lot of financial limitations, we don't want them to stop communicating with their doctors because they would be charged for it. No, I, I agree completely. And this, they're saying here, you know, the range could be fifty to one hundred sixty dollars per message. And <sighs> additionally, it said this person, ProMedica, said that we don't believe charging for electronic messages or messaging will deter patients seeking care. I disagree. I think a lot of patients will just kind of avoid the question, uh, especially if they have to pay these fees. So. It's a trend. It's not, you know, Cleveland Clinic isn't the only one. I think this is going to become uh, wow. more common. You know, this, uh, this is Wendy again. This bothers me too, because I regularly use the patient portal to communicate with my doctors. I ask for medication refills. I ask for, um, I ask if they would fill out forms and um, the doctors have been wonderful. I can't imagine being charged for doing reaching out to them yeah, yeah I, I, I hope it doesn't great. pick up either i mean here it says um 
those who support the clinics, by the way, the clinic is just a reference to the Cleveland Clinic. Okay. Uh, their move to bill for some my chart messages said it wasn't realistic to expect healthcare workers to answer complicated questions okay. for free. So there's gonna be some challenges here, I'm sure, from patients. Oh. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see what the payers' positions might become. You know that the using the banking um, example. I mean, it, in our airlines is even a better example, yeah. where they push you to the chat bots and whatnot. Um, you know, make you wait and forever to talk to a person or answer your question pretty quickly for free in a chat bot. So, if you link this to the telehealth kind of reimbursement model, the, um, like the payers could fix this, you know, they say, <laughs> this is true. I mean, it's, it's, if it, if it, it's a cost reduction, um, avenue, they ought to pick it up and they probably would. That's an interesting point but too. I, but I think it's reasonable, you know, at some point, if you're calling, if you're asking questions, looking for, you know, a diagnosis of sorts, I mean, you're you're really consuming healthcare, so somebody should pay for some of it. You know, uh, renewing a prescription may be a different thing, but um, you know, if I'm calling in asking about my hip pain or something. You know, that's that's the the alternative is actually go, in which case there's a billable visit, which is hundreds of dollars. Uh, what's the difference? Agreed. Yeah, there's, it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds. Sorry. I, th I think the difference, though, is there's already a baseline cost to that. Uh, it, it wasn't given as free to start. This is an added fee on top of, if I'm reading correct. I think that's the difference. It's kind of like if you go into the, the hospital and then like, yeah, we're going to start charging you 50, 50 bucks for parking and $10 an hour to sit in the waiting room. Um, it's It's layering costs on rather than consolidating yeah. and and putting the costs in a transparent and reasonable way these uh, anytime you're doing message costs that's a that's an easily hidden tucked away cost that they're they're yeah um, slipping into you're right system. and i think it, it speaks to the, the the larger pathology using that <laughs> loaded term is that the providers are really in dire margin squeeze that they, they've got to generate they've got a lower cost or increased revenues one way or another um just to be solvent you the know, providers or the really, provider orgs well both i mean providers are generally under pretty severe margin squeeze right now i mean they're not really returning i mean even though most of them call themselves nonprofits, that's kind of a uh, silly distinction they still have to get a return on invested capital and they're not getting it right now you know that for a variety of reasons now you could say that they're just they, they're bloated and they spend too much money um uh, yeah maybe but you know a normal business in a condition like that is looking for new revenue sources and and will exact them wherever it can yeah, um, it's a good point. We have to look at the other side. Organizations, health systems are tight on cash. So this is like their you know, way of trying to increase funding. And it says here, they'll begin billing patients insurance for messages that require five minutes or more of the provider's time to answer. So, Well, but but you can look at their business model and it's it's grown to heavily administrative heavy. So it, yeah. cutting costs at the administrative level is probably a um, long-term viable solution rather than short-term picking the pocket of the patients who in this case are just getting shoved out the door if they don't have that money or shoved out the virtual door. It's, it's, yeah. it, it, you're right. It's a business model, but it's a, it's kind of a, it's kind of an extension of, of a crap anti-patient business model that healthcare in the U.S. already has, and it's just making it worse rather than moving it in a better direction. And those they, they might be losing money, but they're losing money at large scale where they're spending a lot of money. And that, that expenditure for administrators has gone up 
considerably. Uh, universities are the same. They're not, you know, and obviously university hospitals have overlap. There's been a growth in support structure rather than execution of what they're doing. And it, that's probably a better place to look for those cost savings from a long-term viability standpoint. I, I, I think this is ill-advised in the current environment, but it's also, it's also pushing people towards the brink of wanting something more akin to Web3, which is good for this community, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't defending it. I'm just saying it's entirely rational yeah. that what they're doing. Because the only, the only use I can see for a patient portal uh, is correcting your record. So uh, if you did get into your patient portal and were able to see your record and you saw mistakes, then you could go back and, and correct it. But they should pay you for doing that. And with blockchain, they can because that's when you, you're curating your own record and you're adding data to it that you believe is important. And then when, you know, if you're going to add data to your record, including what you ate, what you, uh, your exercise, um, your meditation, all the things that you do, you could really make that record valuable. And then um, it belongs, it, then it, it, it would exist in a patient portal that uh, the doctor can see, and then they should pay you for that information. What do you think about that? Well, that's a whole different can of worms. The patient-generated information, or certainly patients um, modifying their health record, is a brings all kinds of other problems as to the integrity of that data. You know, you blockchains and cryptography and all that play a really interesting role, but we're you know we're nowhere near that yet. So the well, idea that you can get online and start mop, mucking around with your own record is is probably not a good idea and doctors really whatever they might say or what are the ads might say aren't that keen to have more information about you really they're they, they're pretty spent on the time that they're able to spend and um, you know they they come in they've got eight minutes per patient to look at your official record and that's about all they're going to look at that's why the standard of care is so low yep so yeah, it, 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 I don't see how, why it's a different can of worms, as you say. Uh, I think that even if a patient asks a question, that's providing data about what's important to the patient. So, yeah, I mean, all I'm saying is that the 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 whole topic of patient generated information, wearables, et cetera, et cetera, is a whole nother. We could spend two hours on that one, you know, and how how trusted that information can be, whether payment decisions, whether treatment decisions can be based upon um, information that's coming from wherever uh, introduces other complications. Yeah, I, I'm sure we're not gonna solve this today. I'm gonna move on. I know this is a good discussion. And if anyone on YouTube listening has any ideas and what they think, please share, please uh, make a comment, happy to respond. Uh, this is from Digital Salutum. It's a blockchain technology a guide for healthcare leaders. It's published fairly recently, November 14th. And they do, do a pretty good job kind of outlining what blockchain could do for healthcare uh, and also what it can't do too. I'm not going to get into too much details here, but a lot of these things, you know, how blockchain is changing healthcare, talking about um, revolutionizing the way healthcare is delivered. By using a digital ledger, you can track each patient's interactions with healthcare providers and blockchain could reduce fraudulent practices and help keep track of patient data. So things I think that you know we're pretty familiar with as concepts, um, but maybe healthcare leaders might not understand it totally yet. So this is a good guide for anyone who sort of getting to the space pretty new. Uh, and you know, I like that they have some drawbacks of using it to talk about how transaction speed is too too low um but you know there's a lot more that could be expanded on this article either way it's useful uh, it's a good start and um yeah i just want to leave it here for anyone's interest uh the next one here is from scientific american talking about how CRISPR for personalized cancer treatment is actually it's becoming really efficient and 
I don't know if that means affordable, but it means efficient. And, um, you know, there's actually many trials, a small clinical trial has shown researchers can use CRISPR gene editing to alter immune cells so that they will recognize mutated proteins specific to a person's tumors. So this is a very personalized medicine we're talking about here. I think this is interesting because the future is of healthcare. It is more personalized care. Um, and, you know, how do we deliver that? Or what's the infrastructure that allows us to deliver that effectively? Really to be determined still. But I think, you know, CRISPR is definitely one of the biomedical treatments now that's, you know, gaining traction in humans. Uh, so part of the reason that it's so complicated is that there's just a really complicated manufacturing process because once you get your sample from the individual human, you need to you know decipher that gene and take it and then build a therapy based on that individual. Uh, so it takes a lot of time to to do that in the lab. I just think that you know we're starting to see these really novel medicines take take hold and. Now, I'm curious what you guys have, uh, any thoughts on this or any opinions on how maybe blockchain can help, you know, um, I guess what I want to say is target individuals better and make the thing, make the process more efficient. Again, pretty early. Uh, I don't really have any great ideas for this yet, but there's supply chain, you know, components that could be improved, I'm sure, with Web3. I think, you know, if you get to the point where this is more matured, it seems in the extremely early stages, this is one small trial with only 16 people. Um, but if it, if they, if they do prove safety and, and, and prove value in this and expand it, there's probably a number of different factors, genetic, epigenetic, environmental, other things that, that may contribute to any given tumor type. And the more you can have available those details about a wide array of patients, um, the better you can start to zero in on which factors are contributing. And so I think, you know, probably similar to other looks at how uh, blockchain may be able to help enable better data access for cancer research, this, they, it, this fits in there. I don't think it's a, a, a different type of use that has been discussed in a lot of different places and, 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 and is starting to be uh, tried in different places. But I, I think um, this intersects with a lot of the, the cancer and uh, overall genetics screening uh, applications that, that, that have been around um, for blockchain, but uh, haven't really been matured yet um, and are still as far as I know, largely in pilot. I mean, you, you need a large network to make it a value. Getting that large network connected to a system that hasn't been fully set up and, and matured yet is still something that's that's ongoing in, in different places. But I think I think this fits into that overall category, um, but more on the treatment end than the diagnosis end, perhaps. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, the next article is from the Atlantic, but I know that there's many different articles and publications on what's going on with FTX, which was was one of the largest crypto exchanges in the world. Now it's bankrupt, and there's a lot of scandal and issues with the the founder Sam Bankman Fried. Um, it's pretty interesting to see how connected he was in the political space as well as you know the VC space and how many people and organizations sort of missed missed all the red flags and I know some people did raise red flags early on you know I think Elon Musk said he his uh, bullshit meter was on was on fire or something like that when he was talking to Sam so there's a lot of controversy around this how do you guys think it's gonna affect the overall and it's already affected markets but how is it going to affect the adoption or the trust people may or may not have had about web3 and blockchain in general
Yeah. And it looks like, you know, you know, billions of dollars are basically missing and we still, this is still unraveling the story here. So there's a lot, a lot of speculation going on. I don't know. We had an interesting you know, dialogue on this yesterday internally, Sean, that uh, I don't know whether we had a consensus, but if there was one, it's that crypto and blockchain and Web3, even for that matter, aren't the same issue and don't have the same challenges and problems, though they're linked, particularly investors' minds. So, yeah, it's it's somewhat catastrophic to the you know, the risk capital side of the story, what's going on here. The technology is, it's almost irrelevant. You know, what's happened with, with crypto and decentralized ledgers, but, you know, breaking, you know, uncoupling that in people's minds is a new challenge we've got. Certainly, it'll take some time for people to trust the um the ecosystem once again and i think and and, and doug's right there's you know there, there's there's kind of layers to this I, I don't think it's a new challenge though i mean in 2016 and 2017 when i was still working for department of defense and then after i left and was was invited even more to to brief uh individuals in dod on on blockchain and you know crypto is something i i mentioned but didn't really focus on there was a, a higher than the average public familiarity with cryptocurrency there because they had dealt with it as a means of routing and cleaning terrorist funds. And so they viewed, they viewed cryptocurrency as like a tool of the enemy. And I had to deal with that peeling apart. Yes, there were there were money laundering happens with you know crypto just as it happens with car washes. But it is the case that the technology itself underlies a number of uses, both into the financial realm and and elsewhere. And that, and that that's been an ongoing dialogue. I think I think that it 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 resurfaces when stuff like this happens. And of course, you know, this isn't the first time, and it won't be the last time. You know, from Mount Gox to to other things, these are these are going to put a put a mark on you know people's comfort and trust level. On another level, this is this is. I mean, if if you look at the scandal uh, from what you said, Ray, from the political aspect, I mean, this dude bought off politicians and, and media with huge amounts of money. This is this is old school manipulation of the legacy banking system that's now being executed by those who are making money off of crypto. And so perhaps this is, you know, not not the first person you want at the table, but crypto has arrived at the table with regard to how much it can influence society, not just in the corners where people are paying attention to it, but in, you know, moving elections and moving yeah. public opinion behind the scenes the way has always been done by banking and every other legacy industry. So I, I think I think it's a it's a it's a minor setback. In the short term, but it's it's another broader advance into society in the long term well i hope it's minor but i'm afraid it's not i'm afraid that the ill winds that it blows you added the political one that i hadn't really thought much about but related to that um is the i would anticipate that we're going to see more regulatory action now yeah. you know the, the last thing anybody really wants right now is more regulatory friction but it, it public and the politicians will cry out for it what i was most concerned about what i mentioned initially was the um, you know the the investor community is very fickle and very risk averse by their nature and i think it's going to put a it's going to put a real damper on anything that looks like smells like blockchain unfortunately at least to the extent that we can't uncouple those in, in people's minds. One did, you say, did you say investors are risk adverse? Yes. <laughs> extremely risk adverse. It's that that's their business. There's picking out, they've got <laughs> eight projects, you know, that, 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 if they've got 80 projects, they can fund one or two. And the, 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 
primary sieve they use is their perception of risk. Now you can go to, you know, lean canvas kind of techniques to assess that, but that's by and large, that's what they're about is all of their projects are high risk. It's a, it's a matter of picking the least of the high risk programs to fund. Uh, okay. This just adds more, just another, you know, another filter that we're going to have to wade our way through. Yeah. So, Go ahead. Elaine. What I believe is happening is that it's a shift towards asset backed cryptocurrencies. So if a cryptocurrency is anything that's hashed or encrypted, then it would be the tokens that are asset backed carbon housing, you know, real estate, or maybe even medical data. And so this shift, I think, is in the right direction because the whole problem with that BTX was that those there was not there, there was no backing, there, there was there was no FDIC, there was nothing to back up the currency. Um, it, but when there is, you can find people are still trading. You, the carbon market's still hot. Real estate's gaining ground, and I think that they're just going to ignore. This this scandal because it's all the scandal was more about you know backing it up with something that's real instead of just the hype that that Sam was using over. Sure, I mean, hope you're right. Yeah, I mean, one the, component the, the for sure. Was, impressions I get from folks I've talked to is no, it's just it's just another you know it's another slide in the deck that's going to have to be compelling you know it's just another reason to defer to disqualify i mean investors are it's like beauty contest you're not really looking for the, the the prettiest thing you're looking for flaws that you can discount disqualify others and this just gives us you know another another pitfall yeah two things i want to point out about this as well is one, I think this might also encourage people to be more suspicious of exchanges, like you said, Doug and others, uh, and then move their any funds that they have into their own personal custody, self custody, either a hardware wallet or something like that. And I think that's a educational learning point for the industry as well. You know, for people who still have their coins, or, you know, ether, ether, Bitcoin on like Coinbase or something or Gemini, they might think twice and say, maybe I should get a ledger wallet or something to, to move my funds out of an exchange because, you know, that's one thing. And the other point is now there's a effort to show proof of reserves as a, as a way to prove that you do have the assets that are backing what you say you have. Um, so these exchanges are, some of them are working on that. I think some of them are deciding not to share proof of reserves, which is obviously pretty suspicious. Um, and the other thing to mention here is about the political side of this. Sam Beckman fried was the second largest donor to the Biden campaign. So there's a lot of, um, you know, things we still don't know about this whole case. So it'll be interesting to see how connected or how important, and, you know, his father. And also I know that some of his other co-founders or employees are also connected to, um, I know, MIT to some degree and also some other political affiliations. I'm sure you can get into a lot of the juice online. I'm not going to get into all of it now, but there's a lot to dig in here. We'll probably talk about it in our next meeting as well to some degree. Yeah. Any new findings? Well, the problem is, are we going to need accountants and attorneys in the future? <laughs> you know, just how heavily regulated is blockchain going to become? That's the, what I got to keep an eye on. Yeah. I mean, it also points to the fact that the system can be gamed. I mean, you know, they game the system really, obviously it was fraud and, um, you know, it's not going to work out well for them, but they got away with it for a while, obviously not forever, but Still, there's a lot of improvement to to do but, on the regulatory side. That, go, going back to my earlier point, that's where I'm saying this is a huge advance for the crypto world because if you think about it, they're playing in the big leagues now. I mean, this guy was being looked at. He was hanging out with the SEC and being looked at as being an advisor to the SEC. 
So they were always going to regulate. And the question is who was going to be the regulator. And this, this guy was going to be the regulator because he, you know, put a, a pittance of what that company was worth in the, in the right pockets. And so he, they didn't expect crypto to come in and play at that level. And yet he got onto the main stage without much trouble at all. Now it all blew up and that's usually the way these things go, but what kind of damage is done in the, in the short term from a ethical integrity of the, of the regulatory environment. Everything's going to get regulated if it's, if it gets big enough. The question is, is it regulated in a transparent way? And can the, can the blockchain technology underlying some of these things provide more transparency and regulation? Well, self, self, Policing from a regulatory standpoint, providing transparency could be one thing this industry does as it matures that other industries aren't able to do. And that might be able to set the standards. So, you know, obviously we're not able to, to point the direction of everybody. And there's always going to be people and probably still are people who are trying to pull huge scams. But at the same time, the more transparency that can be brought to bear, and I think it was Elizabeth who said, really looking at focusing on those tokens that have uh, an asset backing. And I, I like the, the, the thought of, of medical and health data and health related data being one of those. Um, that's where steady advance and in, in, in the proper direction, I think can be made. So there's, there's, there's a lot of drama here, but it's, it's, it's another step in the maturation of the whole entire industry. Yeah, I, I agree. We shouldn't look at regulation as a enemy. It, for in blockchain, it's actually a um, something that we can benefit from if we do it in a transparent way. And so, for example, if somebody's uh, healthcare data turns out to be in error, and then there should be some kind of a consequence for that, such as, well, that person's wallet is no longer, um, you know. I, you know, the, the data, so the reputation, so there's got to be some stake in it. So if a person has a stake in their own data being uh, correct, their healthcare data being correct, whatever they put on the blockchain, then you could pull that stake and then they lose and they're no longer in the game. And that's one way to make sure that, that we have integrity on the blockchain. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of experiments out there now trying to figure out what is that, what is the crypto economics or incentives behind that staking mechanism for, for health data, for example. Um, and then there's plenty of other types of data, carbon credits. There's so many ways that data is becoming um, itself valuable. So we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Thanks for sharing all your thoughts, guys. Appreciate that. The next article I have here, thought it was interesting, worth mentioning. Uh, it's an exclusive from Reuters uh, a week ago. Yeah. Russian software disguised as American funds is made into U.S. Army and CT. Pretty concerning, I thought. And specifically, there's thousands of smartphone applications in Apple and Google uh, that contain computer code developed by a technology called Pushwush that presents itself as based in the U.S., but it's actually Russian. Uh, the CDC ha said it has been deceived, had been deceived into believing Pushwish was based in the U.S. capital. After learning about its Russian roots from Reuters, it removed Pushwish software from seven public-facing apps. So there were at least seven public-facing apps um, from the CDC that potentially contained code from Russian, I don't want to say hackers, but some sort of Russian um software that's concerning um and according to company documents publicly filed in russia push is headquartered in, in the siberian town of novo sibersk where it's registered as a software company uh, that carries out data processing it has 40 employees and about 2.4 million dollars in revenue last year um so it's registered in russia and I think I read that the push push organization says it does not, yeah, it does not collect sensitive information. 
and Reuters found no evidence push which mishandled users' data. Um, however, so Russian authorities, however, have compelled local companies to hand over user data to domestic security agencies. So the Russian government still has, I think it sounds like they have the right to request data from these companies, which in result is, um, you know, they deliver data of U.S. citizens in that way. So thought it was interesting. I don't know if anyone's heard of this or has been affected by this in any way, if they're involved with the CDC. Um, you know, it's not just the CDC and U.S. Army. There's companies like Unilever, uh, the Union for European Football Association, UFA, uh, the NRA as well. So there's, if this is truly a, you know, a backdoor code Russian situation, hacking situation, it's going to be affecting a lot of different organizations. Um, it's been embedded in almost 8,000 apps, like I mentioned. So another another case of data security and privacy. Um, any Any thoughts or has anyone heard about this? Okay. Well, now you're aware of this. I'll move on. And the best company in the world, according to A16Z, is will be a tele a consumer health tech company. I thought this was interesting to talk about why it would be a health tech company. And I think we've already accepted that or acknowledged that this century or this decade will be the year of Te health tech and biotech and we're, we're really seeing that and i think you know it's interesting to get that validation here as well by a16z saying that you know health tech is a big deal especially for the consumer side um so yeah i just wanted to point this one out i thought it was an interesting report short report um yeah so the most exciting thing about Consumer healthcare is the amount of white space. We'd go so far as to say there is infinite room to improve consumer experience in healthcare and build massive companies as a result. I agree. I feel like <laughs> with all that's out there now, we're still kind of early in the in the patient experience improvement um, strategies. Uh, we've outlined two paths to building consumer healthcare, a consumer healthcare giant, one that's vertically integrated and one that's a horizontal play. Um, that said, numerous healthcare companies will be built in both models. As mentioned, the American healthcare industry is five times the size of the global advertising industry, which makes up most of GAFA's uh, revenue. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how how right they are. I think they're right, but any any thoughts? Okay. Well, it's a small world. I mean, there's, we're having the same conversations in a number of places. Uh, we chewed this one up pretty good yesterday as well, and it's 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 got some really interesting points in it. Um, I think the overall thesis, though, is not that the um, you know, the antitrust fair trade practice laws is, will not allow the vertical to even be considered. Even the horizontal will have lots of problems just by their conclusion, you know, that it's five times as big as advertising and it doesn't, and advertising doesn't as directly affect um, you know, health, I mean, human lives. It affects, you know, the antitrust laws are there to protect market protect markets against uh, abusive or inordinate market power so the idea I mean, just look in real time that epic is being hectored by um or uhg rather i'm sorry uhg is being hectored by doj to to just acquire one more company so the idea that uhg could get much bigger than it already is is already under question so the you know, the idea that the, that somebody is going to get anywhere near 
oligopolistic, let alone monopolistic power in the sector is just not going to happen. Um, I think the what I took away from the article, though, was that the the opportunities for horizontal um, consolidation and expansion are very interesting. Um, you know, someone like I don't know, it's probably not like a Microsoft or an IBM, but somebody that that plays within a particular strata and does a very good job at it could could really get bigger faster. But the vertical power of, you know, say Epic or Apple or somebody subsuming big chunks of healthcare isn't going to happen. Yeah, no, I agreed. Good points. Thanks, Doug. Yeah, I mean, you know, they talk a lot about here um, what they would have to do to be successful. Uh, these companies would have the ability to, you know, plug into the complex healthcare industry. Sure. And work equally well if the consumer health or employer health plan, commercial plan, or government is covering the bill. So that's a really complicated part of this too, right? The whole payments idea or issue. They're saying Visa is the go-to choice because all merchants accept it. Consumers choose Amazon because they sell about just about everything. So I just think it's interesting how they compare, you know, the Visa of, of healthcare. What is the Visa of healthcare now? We don't really have one, right? It's... Yeah, what they didn't say, which I thought would would might be in a different hypothesis, is that CMS itself, or you know, we could move toward a more national health plan, or the government could get bigger itself, which is the age old argument, you know, that the left versus the right, you know, is is healthcare a business or is it a you know something else? Um, but they didn't really they didn't take that one. Well, you know, to your point, and also back to Sean's point originally, is if they did do that, let's say CMS, and we had a national payer, will it be a transparent system, right? Will we be able to see all the transactions that are going on? And if so, that's that's great. I think that's what, you know, we'd want to to have um, so that people can be held accountable. We'll see. Um, any other thoughts on this article? Well, I, I, the, the idea of what's the visa for healthcare, I, I think what's interesting is, you know, the distinction you hear frequently from a lot of different folks is, you know, healthcare and health. Uh, we, we don't have a, a, a unified market for health in the U.S. We have, we have a healthcare market and as fractured as it is, it's, you know, making lots of money and a lot of money goes through it, but that's, that's not, it's, it's more from, from a, just transactional, what I'm buying and selling and mar being marketed, that's more I, uh, like a disaster relief than it is a day-to-day -day transactions. I, I, you know, I do my shopping at, at the store or on Amazon or this, but the, the health part of health is largely uncaptured there. It's the health care part when someone gets sick. A little bit of maintenance is worked into that, but because we only have a an economy set up around the 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 endpoint when there's a problem it's a very it's a very big and very dynamic and very messy but very skewed and only partial economy i think i think the the health economy is potentially much 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 bigger even than they're realizing and maybe they maybe they kind of sense it and just haven't articulated it here and i think being able to motivate incentivize capture guide help people towards health um, separate or, you know, pre that healthcare portion is where the, the, the biggest gold mine is. And I think that from, a, you know, blockchain standpoint, there's a lot of value the technology brings to fractionalizing costs, incentivizing things, and also being a um, distributed and immutable uh, ledger for, what has happened and you know we talked earlier about self-reported data from patients well if if it's not me reading off of some sort of device but instead that device feeding information or making available information that can be um validated through some sort of blockchain mechanism that that brings a huge level of value to social determinants data to non-health but health related data and i think that's where a, a lot of a lot of this this huge uh um 
future market, if you will, is. I, I, I think it's barely been barely been tapped into from the health aspect, but the healthcare aspect obviously can have a lot of improvement as well. That was a little bit rambling, but I'm just sort of oh, seeing fine. this as, as really just the tip of the iceberg. I think it's a great point. The um, flipping back to the what you're suggesting would take a, a huge paradigm shift, at least in America and in other places, that the focus isn't just upon health care, it's, it's even more on payments, you know, who's going to, in other words, what care is provided is somewhat less of a concern to the system as a whole as to who pays for it and how it gets paid for. And the, you know, the issue of, of shifting that further away from consumers or, or not moving back toward patients themselves is, you know, it's not, unfortunately, not the trend line we're on. So if you're, if you're trying to move the, the center of gravity toward health versus health care, that means patients themselves have to be a lot more involved, not a lot less involved. So right now they're not very involved. You know, their they're care providers sort of decide what they're going to get. And then the payers decide on top of that, whether they agree with the providers or not. And then they argue, you know, policy argues back and forth. So we're not moving in the right direction um, for what you're suggesting, but I think it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, ma it's a matter of framing and incentivization. I mean, the, the NFL is a, is a five, you know, the, all the NFL teams are worth $5 billion or somewhere in that neighborhood. It's a series of groups that have been playing a game for entertainment for, close to a century now. Um, fantasy football, which only is really off paper, you know, in the past 20 years become something has, has four times that value. So we went from having a very popular sport that has a huge amount of value in what they've created, but then people found a different way of incentivizing and becoming interested in a very statistically heavy and and weird minutia. If you, if you did this back in the 90s, people used to make fun of me. And then all of a sudden, now it's 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 four times the value. The, the the market for fantasy football is nearly four times the value of of NFL combined. So you can take a populace and make them more interested in a weird minutia that they have control over. I think I think gamifying health has a has a huge role to play in in this. Not just a straight incentivization, but a gamification um, could become big and you're seeing that in some of the things like peloton and some of these these connected uh exercise and health efforts that now have people competing in their health i think that that's probably going to play a role in it too i know we're getting close to time so i'll stop there Go yeah on. no i appreciate that both sean and doug i think you know just last point i want to mention is um if you think about retail investing now it's a huge thing that maybe 20 30 40 years ago people were kind of relied on their financial advisor or whatever to invest for them. So now it's been gamified with like, you know, um, different apps and things. So how can we do that for healthcare? Right. And, but in a way that's productive and not sort of, you know, bad for humanity. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for being here today and participating in this conversation. Uh, one last thing, there's an educational nugget here. I published an article or sorry, a podcast with, Shinya Yamamoto from Japan. And we talk about Web3 innovation in Japan. He runs an accelerator in Tokyo. Did you guys know Tokyo was the most populated city in the world? I found that out. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to let you guys know about that. And again, to all the Americans on the call and everybody else, thanks again. Happy Thanksgiving. Hope to see you guys next time.